the middle of the road, Nathan wakes up and realizes he's been in a car accident. His vehicle is wrecked at the roadside, but Nathan doesn't have a scratch on him. Suddenly, he's startled by Daniel, the biker he collided with. To Nathan's surprise, Daniel isn't hurt either. Daniel asks that Nathan remembers getting out of the car, and Nathan admits he doesn't, blaming the shock and hitting his head on the dashboard. Strangely, he has no wounds and feels no pain. Then Daniel drops a bombshell. They're actually dead, and these are their ghosts. He believes he died first. He's been there for several minutes initially in denial, but now there's no other explanation. Nathan refuses to accept this and checks his car finding the driver's seat completely crushed. Looking closer, he sees his own body inside. Shock Nathan steps back and starts having an existential crisis thinking about his friends and kids. Daniel mentions missing his wife and finds it odd that Nathan didn't mention the kid's mother. As Nathan continues to panic, Daniel insists this proves the afterlife exists making Nathan even more frantic. Daniel forces him face reality by dragging the body out of the car and covering its face with a handkerchief when Nathan becomes uncomfortable. Just then, a car comes down the road and stops by the body. Nathan tries to ask for help, but the driver can't see or hear him. The man checks the body with his foot to ensure it's dead, then robs Nathan and drives away. Finally, Nathan accepts he's a ghost and wonders if judgment is next. He confesses to killing his wife, but insists it was an act of mercy. Before he can elaborate, Daniel hears music around them. Suddenly, a mysterious white door appears, and the area is covered in snow. Daniel swears the music comes from the door, but Nathan hears nothing. As they approach, a red door appears behind them, looking sinister with screams emanating from it that only Nathan can hear. They deduce the white door leads to heaven and the red one to hell, suggesting Nathan is being punished for killing his wife. Nathan panics, explaining his wife was sick and he only wanted enter suffering. Ignoring this, Daniel tries to cross through the white door, but Nathan pushes him aside and goes first. Nothing happens. Daniel advises Nathan to behave better to get a better door, and Nathan apologizes for not seeing Daniel's bike while driving. Daniel admits he was distracted by a girl playing by the roadside. They hug goodbye, and Daniel crosses the white door, but nothing happens to him either. He tries again, but to no avail, and stops hearing the music. A voice speaks behind them, and the little girl, Daniel saw earlier, appears revealing she's also dead. She explains that a man on a bike ran into her prompting Daniel to confess he had been drinking before driving. Nathan explains it wasn't just an accident. Daniel had been reckless and killed an innocent child. After a brief argument, they try to guide the girl to the door, but she's been taught not to trust strangers and starts screaming. They fail to calm her down, and Daniel, growing impatient, picks her up and throws her into the white door. The girl disappears instantly, and so does the white door. Realizing it's their turn across, Daniel hesitates, so Nathan kicks him through the door before explaining his situation with his wife again. He insists he didn't do refuses to go. Suddenly, a huge monster appears on the road, carrying souls in its flaming Terrified, mouth. Nathan finally crosses the red door. Daphne finds himself in hell surrounded by thousands of unconscious souls. He collapses in shock upon finding a young girl. When he grabs her hand, he sees her memories. The girl, Jean, has trouble sleeping due to creepy shadows in her room and her parents' constant arguing. Her mother wants to help Jean, but her father is scared of her and believes they need protection from her. Jean blames the on a large tree outside her window. One night, she goes downstairs for a snack and makes herself a jam sandwich looking happy despite her clumsiness with a knife. Later, Jean visits her therapist, telling her about feeding cookie crumbs to baby birds, which made the mother bird worry and fly her. Jean reacted by strangling all the birds. She also admits to poking her little sister with pens out of hatred and wanting to hurt her parents, whom she is harmed in their sleep, leading them to lock her in her room every night. When the therapist asks about Jean's actions toward her sister, Jean refuses to talk further. The next morning, Jean demands breakfast, but no one comes. She ends up eating a bowl of cereal, her clothes covered in blood with her parents' bodies lying nearby. 
She ensures they're truly dead and kisses her mother goodbye. She then makes more bread with jam and heads to the basement, which looks like a vast cave. There she feeds her friend Tony, a humanoid yet to form being. John thinks Tony killed her parents, but he denies it. As Tony eats, Jean announces that he can now live with her upstairs, since her parents are dead. Tony, a man by the warm sunlight he's never experienced, wanders around the house. Jean takes him to the bathroom and teaches him how to use the bathtub while she puts on her mother's makeup and jewelry. Tommy marvels at the sensation of clean water on his deformed skin. Moments later, Tony puts on clean clothes that once belonged to Jean's father. Jean asks him for help moving the bodies, but first wants to prepare a surprise as a final goodbye. Using her imagination, Jean sets up a play with her parents' bodies as the audience. She narrates her story of waking up to no breakfast, pretending and is laughing at her jokes. Then she drags Tony to the stage with a chain announcing him as the killer who will be executed. Tony denies killing anyone saying he has no memories before appearing in the cave. Jean makes the imaginary audience vote for his execution and Tony is forced to step on a stool to hang himself. Afterward, Tony hides the mother's body under the double bed while Jean happily jumps on it, reminiscing about teasing her parents with a knife while they slept. Tony then brings the father's body to hide it too and realizes he can't see himself in the mirror, confirming he represents Jean's dark side and that she killed her parents. Unable to cook, they have and bread with jam for lunch. At that moment, the doorbell rings and Jeannie opens it to find the mailman who needs an adult to sign for a delivery. Jean calls for Tony, but gets no response. The mailman leaves a missed delivery card and goes. Jean desperately searches for Tony, not finding him downstairs. As she runs, her creepy drawings are shown. She eventually finds Tony in her parents' room, feeding on their bodies. She yells at him to stop as the door closes. Later, as her toys burn, Jean checks on her little sister, who has drawn a picture of murder. Jean tells her sister that Tony is hungry and takes her to the kitchen, where she pushes her into the oven and turns it on. Jean then leaves the kitchen, seeing happily as shadows follow her on the walls. In hell, Nathan is disgusted by what he has witnessed and crawls away. He finds a teenage girl and her mother and touches the next. The mother, Julia, is in the kitchen trying to make tea while holding back a breakdown. She calls her daughter's name but gets no answer. She notices a dry blood stain on the table, which makes her feel worse when she tries to scratch it off. Still in denial, goes to the bathroom and takes her daughter Chloe's body out of the tub filled with bloody water. She cries as she drags Chloe around like a doll, eventually placing her at the kitchen table. Julia serves breakfast for her and talks about possibly going on a vacation together. A flashback from the previous morning shows Chloe in the bathtub, trying to buy time. Julia reminded her to hurry up because they couldn't be late to school every day. During breakfast, Chloe listened to her mom arguing with co-workers on the phone while staring at a knife. Memories of being violently harassed at school haunted her making her life miserable. The quick prick from the knife made Chloe's finger bleed, causing the stain on the table. When it was time to leave, Chloe tried to explain she couldn't take it anymore and want to skip school but Julia dismissed her concerns thinking she was just being dramatic. In the present, Chloe's body slides off the chair and a cat appears to lick the wound from her self-inflicted death. Julia scares the pet away and places Chloe in a wheelchair, ignoring her ringing phone. Suddenly, she snaps and declares her going on a trip. Julia rushes her closet, gathering a few things while breaking down again. She covers Chloe with a blanket professing her love despite not always being there for her. Julia announces Chloe won't have to go to school anymore. She'll be homeschooled instead. As Julia opens the front door to leave, she's shocked to find it blocked by a brick wall. This triggers a flashback of Chloe hiding in a bathroom stall while being bullied by girls who taunted her and filmed the incident. Back in the present, the brick wall is metaphorical, representing Julia's neighbor, who visits after hearing Julia's screen. Panicked, Julia insists they're leaving for a vacation, but the neighbor senses something is wrong and enters the house discovering Chloe's body moments later. Julia drives away with Chloe's body in the passenger seat crying as she reminisces about the day, 
Chloe was born and promises her a better life. Julia pleads with Chloe to respond eventually closing her eyes distracted Julia crashes the car into a tree. In a flashback, Chloe self-deletes in the bathtub and her mother finds her. Julia wakes up bleeding after the crash realizing firefighters are breaking down the door to rest her. She struggles against her arms, unwilling to leave her daughter behind. While some firefighters drag Julia away, others find Chloe dead and assume she died in the accident. Chloe's placed in a body bag despite Julia's cries and pleas. In hell, Nathan covers the bodies of the women and collapses on the ground, weary from witnessing endless tragedies. Suddenly, the devil appears announcing he'll guide Nathan to his punishment. Once again, Nathan tries to explain that his wife had multiple sclerosis, but the devil counters that she was not of sound mind and had not consented to euthanasia making Nathan guilty. The devil begins leading Nathan to another area, explaining that initial stage of eternal damnation involves semi-isolation to erase all memories of their past lives, turning souls into pure beings of pain, and despair Matham passes through a new door and finds himself in a dark room with other resting souls. The devil informs him that this isolation will last four, zero years a mere prelude to the suffering that will follow as Nathan panics, the devil departs sealing the entrance behind him, suddenly a bee, blanket stirs, and a decayed soul named Billy emerges. Billy mistakes Nathan for his new target and viciously attacks him, smashing his head and hurling him around without remorse. Nathan is beaten until he no longer responds, causing Billy to realize he has destroyed Nathan's soul, compelling him to reincarnate. In the real world, a mother gives birth to a healthy baby as the devil informs Billy that by sending a damned soul back, he's unwittingly created the Antichrist. In rage, the devil punishes Billy by decapitating him, explaining that his body will regenerate and assigning him a new mission to retrieve Nathan's soul. Some later, Billy appears in the baby's room, poised to fulfill his dark purpose. Make sure to subscribe for more recaps like this.